Thank you very much for your attention. And we're going to bring up now our final and a very interesting speaker for the day, Dr. Sabrina Brennan. And she's going to talk about sort of the culmination of everything that we've talked about today, about um, keeping healthy, getting healthy, staying healthy, keeping the brain um, as big as possible. Uh, so she is going to give a presentation to us on brain health. So, Sabina. I think I should have some slides coming up. Brilliant. Um, hello to everybody here and to everybody in the 23 countries. That's great, really, isn't it? Fantastic technology. Um, everybody with a brain needs to consider brain health because as adults, um, we, use a we lose a little brain volume every year through a process called atrophy or wasting. Um, in MS, that atrophy or wasting happens more rapidly. And in fact, in people with relapsing remitting MS, um, they lose brain volume more rapidly than somebody without MS who's the same age. So it's really, really important to look after brain health as soon as possible. And the, the take home message from today is that key lifestyle changes, small attitude adjustments, and certain activities that can protect and boost brain health um, are actually easy to introduce into your daily routine. Um, I'm on a mission to make people think about brain health every day just the same way as they think about dental health. Um, I've made more than 30 animated films um, on brain health. They're all available online. I've developed a free brain health app and a number of websites. And I'm delighted to say I've also developed um, a website, Brain Health, specifically for people living with MS. Um, whenever I develop any of my materials, the first thing that I do is consult with the people for whom the materials are for to make sure that I'm developing something that they want, that they need, that addresses the questions that they have. So before I start, I just want to say thank you to MS Ireland because they actually facilitated that consultation. Um, and also thank you to the 500 um, people who completed the survey that actually informed uh, the content and the development um, of the website. And also then to those who actually tested out the website and the app and the animations um, before we went live. So the website is brainhealthforms.com. Um, it's divided into two parts. Uh, the brain section of the website uh, serves up the basics on how your brain works and how MS affects it. The health part of the we website arms you with information on um, building brain healthy habits. Um, Within uh, the website, there's a number of sections. Uh, brain 101 does exactly what it says. It gives you all those basics on brain health. Um, the cognitive section goes into detail around your cognitive function, which are um, brain um, activities that allow you to be yourself, in, in a sense. Um, they allow you to remember, to think, to plan, to organize, to make decisions. Um, and when they're affected by MS, that's called cognitive impairment. Now, the interesting thing is, generally speaking, um, when people first get a diagnosis of MS, they tend to think about the physical impact and how that might, um, uh, how mobility issues might affect their independence. And generally speaking, they don't give much consideration to how cognitive um, impairment might impact on their functioning. And in fact, it can um, impact quite significantly on quality of life. But the good news is that there are things that you can do um, to boost your brain health. And, and it really is important. Um, you can boost your brain health by building up um, what we call cognitive reserves. And the health part of the rep website and this talk really will focus on um, that concept of cognitive reserve and on um, how you can keep your brain healthy. Um, so basically, when we talk about cognitive reserve, or, uh, reserve we're really talking about resilience, um, about 
how some people have the ability to, to, to maintain relatively stable function in the face of adversity. And throughout life, that adversity can take many forms. You know, it can be, um, you know, an accident or grief or financial loss. In this context, we're talking about it in terms of the adversity being um, MS, the disease. Um, the, in, in, in the area of research that I work in, we call this resilience cognitive reserve. And it comes from the repeated observation that there is no direct relationship between the degree of brain injury or brain disease and the clinical manifestation of that brain damage or the pathology in the brain. And that happens across stroke, dementia and, and in MS. So basically two people could sustain a stroke of the same magnitude and one person has severe impairment and, and the other person has much less impairment. And we use this concept of resilience cognitive reserve to explain that difference. We say that the person who has less impairment has higher, um, higher levels of cognitive reserve. Um, Basically, this area of research exploded from um, a, a study excuse me, that was done by a researcher called Katzman back in 1989. It originates from dementia research. That's where my background um, also is. Um, and basically, um, he was actually trying to look at the brains, trying to understand dementia as a disease, and looking the, at the brains of people um, post-mortem. Um, and as with any sort of research study, uh, he was looking at people who had the a diagnosis of Alzheimer's before they died and also controls in that same nursing home. Um, and actually what he found um, was that in his control group, he had 10 people who had sufficient pathology in their brain for a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease who were functioning perfectly normally before they died. They had no perceptible symptoms. So that was a really, really exciting um, discovery. So how can they have the disease in their brain and not have any of the symptoms of dementia? So really from that, the whole area of research exploded, and it continues today, certainly in the area of dementia. But throughout the 1990s, several, several scientists got involved, and they started to look at it in the concept of reserve in several diseases. And more recently, it has been, um, scientists have been studying the concept in multiple sclerosis. Um, and several studies at this stage conclude that higher cognitive reserve may actually protect people with MS from cognitive dysfunction. So your brain has the capacity for resilience, provided you give it a helping hand by living a brain healthy lifestyle. What we do, and actually just as importantly, what we don't do, um, influence has how resilient our brain can be when faced with um, diseases like MS, also with brain injury, and also with aging, and also too with diseases like dementia. And I was saying to someone earlier at lunchtime, I am talking about brain health um, in the context of MS here, but unfortunately having MS doesn't give you a free pass to say that you mightn't be susceptible to dementia in later life either. So this brain health message is, is for everybody, particularly for people with MS, but you know, um, even in, outside of the context of your MS, it may help you in, in later life in terms of um, giving you a certain um, resilience against um, other late life diseases. So I like to think that adopting a brain healthy life is like investing in brain cap capital. It'll not only keep your brain healthy now, but also allow you to build up these reserves that you can cash in at some point in the future to cope with or compensate um, for damage, disease, or even um, decline um, associated uh, that can be associated with aging. Um, so some of the key messages I just want to take you to take home from today are that cognitive impairment is not an inevitable part of MS. A similar Similarly, actually, it's not an inevitable part of aging. Um, your brain is resilient, um, it is possible to boost reserves, and it's possible to maintain your brain and build resilience. And so the rest of the talk here, I'm going to um, talk a bit more about cognitive function in MS, your brain, um, about brain health, and then to give you some what I call hacks, which are brain health um, tips. So, um, how is cognitive function um, affected in multiple sclerosis? Um, 
The thing, and, and, and it is really important to underline this, severe decline in general cognitive function in MS is really very rare. Mostly people will find just one or two areas of their cognitive function are affected. About 45% to 65% of people will, uh, with MS will experience some form of disruption to their cognitive functioning. That means that there's a whole other group of people who don't experience the cognitive functioning and that's where research is trying to look at to try and understand why those people who have MS lesions in their brain aren't experiencing those disruptions and is that more you know is that related to cognitive reserve and lifestyle and if it is hopefully then we can start to bring down those numbers and have less people experiencing um, cognitive symptoms. Um, whether or not you'll experience um, dysfunction in your cognitive functioning cannot be predicted on the basis of any of your other symptoms. It's not related to the duration of your disease, to the severity or to the type of MS. Um, the impairment can be permanent but it can also be temporary. Um, it can be experienced in varying degrees of severity. Um, it can occur early in the disease as well as later in the disease. And it can occur in individuals who um, are mildly disabled or severely disabled. So there's no real pattern in that regard. So what functions, what cognitive functions are affected in MS? Well, memory um, um, is, is frequently affected. About 40 to 60 percent of, peop of people who experience um, say that they experience uh, disruptions um, in their memory function. Attention, executive function, I'll explain what that is in a few moments. Langu less commonly language and visual um, perception. And then lots of people do speak about um, what we call speed of processing. So it really just takes a little longer to make sense of information, make sense of what somebody has said to you, and formulate a response. So it just takes a little longer to do those things that maybe used to happen much more quickly. Um, and also um, some issues around controlling expression of um, emotion, so a little bit less self-control in, in um, how you express um, yourself. Um, just to briefly talk about memory, um, we tend to just in everyday language talk about memory as if it was a single thing, you know, and that particularly happens with dementia. People say, oh, their memory is gone. But the thing is, memory isn't a single thing. There's lots of different types of memory. And actually, they, to put it very um, sort of broadly, they kind of occur in different parts of the brain. So, you know, um, it really will, what, what's, what's affected will, will depend on what area of your brain is affected. But the different types of memory, um, say if you tell someone about your first kissed, kiss, that's called your, called your event memory. Um, if you get a question right at a pub quiz, that's your fact memory. Um, if you fix the leak under the sink or ride a bicycle, that's your procedural memory. You also have another kind of memory called your prospective memory, and that's about remembering to do something in the future. So remembering to take your tablets this evening, or remembering to go to that concert where you bought tickets, which you bought tickets for four months ago. And um, that's memory of the future. Memory is defined in lots of different ways, um, by the kind of content that you're remembering, um, but also by the duration. So we have long-term memory and short-term memory. So long-term memory is anything really from more than about six minutes ago. Short-term memory are the things that are really just happening in the moment. And short-term memory is very important because it also helps you with another type of memory, which is called working memory. So if you're in a queue in a supermarket and you've got six items and you're trying to tot up maybe how much to make sure have you got enough cash to pay for it, you have to hold a lot of information, short-term memory information, and then you've got to manipulate it, which is working memory. Um, and, and so they're kind of inter interrelated in that way. In MS, if you are experiencing um, impairment in memory function, um, it will most likely be in short-term memory, memory for recent things. So you might find it very frustrating that you can remember a poem word for word that you learned when you were 10 in school and you can't remember what was said five minutes ago or you can't remember um, what you went into a room for. The thing is to remember, these kind of memory slips happen to everybody. 
They happen to everybody. They happen to people when they're extremely stressed um, or very tired. Um, so they do happen to everybody. They just happen more frequently in people with multiple sclerosis. Um, and then also um, uh, people with MS report experiencing problems with prospective memories. So if you do experience um, issues with memory function, it may be useful to try and help identify which type of memory it is, and that then may help you to introduce a strategy, which I'm going to talk about some later, as which kind of strategy might be the most useful to help you to support any deficits you have with that memory. Because it's all about just being able to continue functioning, getting on, doing what you want to do, and living independently. So, um, again, with attention, there are different types of attention. Um, so, People with MS have reported um, experiencing um, impairment in selective attention. So that's when we talk about selective attention, we're talking about um, being able to um, attend to more than one thing at a time and to concentrate on one task and ignore distractions. So you know, say there's conversations going on or there's a TV on and you're actually trying to read something or write something. You have to be very selective about your attention. And in MS, that can become more difficult. It can be hard to get, you know, to shut out those distractors. Um, dividing your attention um, between two activities like walking and talking um, or preparing a, a meal and holding a conversation. There also seems to be that people find some difficulties with that. And then also with another type of attention which we call sustained attention, um, which um, requires um, you spending long periods of time. So like reading a book requires sustained attention. Um, so does watching a TV show. You have to hold your attention and focus and hold a lot of information in your brain to keep making sense of the words that you're reading or what's going on in the, in, in the, in the TV show. So people have reported that they find that their mind wanders and that they, for example, would have to keep rereading the same section. Again, that happens everybody, um, but it just happens more frequently in multiple sclerosis. Um, concentrating for long periods. Also, keeping track of where you were, what you were doing, what you were saying, if you become interrupted. It seems to be very hard if someone interrupts you while you're doing a task to get back to what it was you were doing. Um, uh, and also then it becomes more difficult to have conversations with noise in the background, like radio and TV and those kind of things. Language, as I said, um, is, 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 is less frequently um, impaired, um, but a lot of people report that tip of the tongue experience, finding, finding it hard to, to, to find the right word. Also reported, reporting knowing the word, but not being able to say it. Um, and, and this always reminds me of that game charades, but, but being able to describe the function of the word, but not be able to say the word. Um, also people report problems with fluency. So, that, by that, what, what we mean by that is being able to choose the words that you really want to choose to express yourself the way you want to express yourself. You're less fluent, perhaps, than you felt that, that you used to be. And then also getting sidetracked. So that sort of thing, someone asks you a question and starting to answer and going down a few different avenues and kind of have to go, what, what was the question? Do you know, just kind of really just losing that, that train, of, train, of, train of thought. Um, so another impairment to cognitive function is an impairment that affects visual perception. Um, and this again is sort of linked to that speed of processing that I, that I spoke about earlier. MS can affect the speed at which the visual information is processed in your brain. So you can see a piece of a, a, an item but it doesn't look um, like you expected it to look. Um, that you're actually looking at something, it's right in front of you but you can't see it even if it's in front of you. Um, problems recognising people's faces, judging depth and distance and actually problems with direction um, right um, or left and that really seems to be down to um, that the signals are just slower um, coming into the system. In terms of strategies um, for attention, um, really, you know what, just get rid of the distractions. Do you know? If TVs and radios in the background are making life much more challenging for you and using up cognitive resources, just turn them off. 
you know, um, similarly, if there's visual distractors, you know, anything, just make places, you know, calmer um, and, and get rid of them. Um, a lot of people report that mindfulness, um, they find that helpful. Um, I find mindfulness, at, you know, the, the research shows it's, it is very helpful. I find it very hard to do, but present mindedness is really just being focused in the moment. That's kind of very useful and that can help uh, with attention. Just really focus on what you're doing while you're doing it. Um, take rest when you need rest and um, pacing yourself just you know acknowledge that things may take a little longer and and, and just pace yourself with regard to speed of processing and um, for me that's uh, what I think is really very interesting is our brain controls pretty much everything that we do and um, and yet because it's hidden behind this skull of ours you know people really don't think about it very often and if, as some of you have here, an outward sign of a physical impairment, um, you have no problem and, and other people have no problem in allowing you to take the time necessary to get from A to B, right? You're a bit slower on your feet or it's just going to take longer to get there. Yet, when it's something to do with your brain function or finding a word, we tend to be much harder on ourselves. And we don't allow ourselves, and actually frequently we don't allow others the time because we start butting in trying to finish the sentence for them. And we start, um, you know, or people feel these awkward silences. So if your speed of processing is slower, give yourself permission to take the time because you will find the world. If you get stressed about it, that's going to add another bad thing into the mix and make it less likely that you'd find the word. So if you give yourself permission to take the time for the word itself to come, for the process to happen, and to ask others for the permission to be, for, for, you know, to be patient with you, that it just takes you a little longer. Um, because you want to continue doing it and, and, and speaking. And so, um, yeah, I, I just think we need to start asking for those things when they're, they're, they're more invisible. Um, again, moving distractions will, removing distractions will help that. Um, again, with the word finding, if, if, if you really can't find the word, yeah, you, you know, kind of, to get the message across, go down that charades route, you know, <laughs> describe the thing, um, you know, pick something that looks like it. I mean, we all kind of have to do that sometimes. Uh, again, the patience, um, look for pictures of it, try and self-cue yourself um, with words. Um, when it comes to executive functioning, um, take a step back. Um, so I should explain, um, I just wonder do I have executive functioning there? I thought I had another slide with executive functioning. Um, executive functioning, um, what we mean by that is um, it's like your control room uh, in your brain. It kind of regulates your behaviors and um, it's involved in self-regulation in those kind of what we refer to as like higher, higher order functions, so planning, organizing, decision making, all those kind of things. So it's like an executive controller on your brain, an overseer, um, and that can impact um, on you and be affected in MS. Um, so if it, those kind of things, the problem solving, those kind of more, much more complex tasks, take a step back. If something is really, you know, you can't figure out a problem or whatever, take a step back away from it. Take, take time, think about it, you know, um, set goals, set realistic goals and schedule tasks. If things are going to be more complex for you to do, well then take account of that. Don't be putting unnecessary pressure, but don't stop doing them. It's important to continue challenging yourself, but just acknowledge that you may need more time to do that. With regard to memory strategies, um, I mean, we live in a, a high tech times Everybody, I can't survive without technology to support my memory. Um, everybody uses them. We all have iPhones, phone numbers. No, nobody knows phone numbers. I see plenty of people around the same age in the, in the audience as me. You used to have to store everybody's phone number in your head. You used to store your bank account number in your head. You used to store your staff number in your head. You'd nowhere else to store it. So you used to have it in your head. Now nobody has those things in their head. I actually don't even know my husband's phone number because it's on speed dial. Do you know? Um, so we all use technology. And the thing is, 
with MS, if your memory function um, is being affected by the disease, well then really what you need to do is be much more systematic about using those technology and supports and make much more wider use of those technologies and supports because in doing so then you will be freeing up your cognitive function to do other things and you'll be supporting yourself where your memory might might be failing you that that, that technology will support you so that you can continue doing what you want to do so it's well worth taking the time to sit down and stick regular reminders in your phone for recurring tasks and um, be really disciplined any plans that you make any hospital appointments any visits with friends any of those kind of things be disciplined put them straight into whatever system you use your calendar on your phone straight away put all of your reminders in then you can relax knowing that they're all in there set a realistic reminder and the reminder will will come up i also suggest there's a nice little tip when you update your contacts in your phone for, for, for people, say if you have problem remembers people, people's names or the names of their kids or what football team they follow or those kind of things, you can actually add all that sort of information into their, into their contact on your phone. And so it's like a little memory reminder uh, as you look it up and you can, you can have a little look, say before you're going to meet someone for coffee, you have like a little, a little refresher um, for it. And make use of things like notepads and voice record. I saw that earlier on the videos that were paying on the loop, you know, about people saying record your meeting with your, with your doctor so that you don't miss any of the important information. Um, obviously you have to ask people's permission when you are recording those kind of things. Um, <laughs> But yeah, no, it's very useful to have that. I do that all the time where I can because I just find there's so much in my head um, so often now that I, I, I you know, I kind of can't trust it. So I, I record things. Um, and then you can go old school without the technology. Use post-it notes, calendars, wall planners, whatever. But the point being, make sure you make use of things to support any deficits that you have. Um, if there's things that you find you frequently lose, and we all do that, like glasses, uh, car keys, passports, important things that you need, that there seems to be a panic every morning when you go to leave the house. Where the bloody hell did I leave my keys? Just make a one-stop drop for those. One place, uh, get into a habit, force yourself to put those in that place. It takes about two to three weeks to build that habit and then it will become automatic. And then you get all that extra time that you normally spend running around the place looking for your keys, etc. cetera. Um, and it also cuts down on stress. Um, which really isn't good for, for, for brain health. So again, it's, it's just about um, being disciplined. Another little trick is, the thing is with, with memory, if, if, if you cast your mind back to when you were um, a child, preschool um, playing, if, or if you watch any child, they learn about the world, they explore the world through all of their senses. They touch the world, they taste it, they feel it, they smell it. Um, and learning and memory are, are really one of this, the, the, the same thing. You know, that's how you learn, you learn and you remember. Then we go to school and we get this huge focus on learning through language and learning by rote and learning off by heart. And in fact, little five and six year olds, we used to be told to put our arms behind our back or, or fold your arms so that you didn't touch and you didn't fiddle and you didn't interact with the world. And so our memory then becomes very, and our memories become very restricted in our brain. They're embedded with the language part of our brain. So a tip for creating new memories and if you want to give your, your, your brain a better chance of being able to recall memories is engage as many of your senses as possible. If you think about memories that have meaning for you, when you met first, your first love or you know, when something happened, you, you remember lots more. You, you, know, you remember the smell of someone's perfume or you remember whether there was, you felt sun on your face. or you, know, you remember the whole experience. And the thing is, if the part of your brain um, associated with language becomes damaged, you'll still be able to access those memories through the other senses through which you created the memory. Does that make sense to people? Sorry, I didn't mean to, that double pun of sense. But yes, use all your senses. 
So um, one final thing I just want to say about cognitive function um, in MS is that some MS symptoms are falsely interpreted as cognitive deficits and they're, they're not cognitive deficits, they're physical deficits. So um, poor art articulation, poor coordination, uh, rapid eye movement. Um, and then it's also important to note that some factors can temporarily impair your cognitive function. So fatigue um, will impact on your cognitive function, tiredness and relapses temporarily. Um, also emotional changes, if you're going through a, you know, turmoil, arguments, those kind of things, lifestyle changes, physical restrictions and drugs. Any medication that's going to act on your central nervous system is going to impact on your um, cognitive functioning. Alcohol will, as will um, marijuana. And I mean, I'm aware, I'm aware there's certain benefits around pain management with those kind of issues, but it is about weighing up whether it impacts on cognitive function and their individual um, choices and discussions to, to, to make with um, medical professions. So, just to come back to cognitive reserve, since that original study back in 1989, we now know, and this is in the context of dementia research, we now know that about 25% of people during autopsy who fulfill the criteria for a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease were clinically intact before they died. That's a lot of people. Um, so some, for some reason, some people can maintain better brain function even in the face of disease, the physical disease in their brain, the pathology. And we know that this resilience is linked to certain lifestyle factors. Um, so my mission is to get people living that brain healthy life so we can increase those numbers, certainly in later life when it comes to um, dementia. So what I'm going to do is now is show you one of my little short films um, that will explain to you uh, what cognitive uh, reserve is. Is cognitive reserve. We all know people who are really resilient. People who keep on keeping on no matter what life throws at them. Well, our brain has the capacity for resilience too, provided we give it a helping hand by living a brain-healthy lifestyle. For example, when a disease like multiple sclerosis strikes, it attacks brain and spinal cord tissue, causing communication problems within the central nervous system that can lead to physical, visual or cognitive impairments. We know that some people with multiple sclerosis can tolerate more disease pathology than others while still retaining cognitive function. Scientists believe that their resilience in the face of disease pathology is linked to certain life exposures. Here's how they think it works. The brain has an inbuilt but finite resource called neurological reserve. This reserve allows the brain to retain function by reorganizing itself to compensate for brain atrophy and lesions. It reroutes communication pathways to avoid damaged areas and adapts undamaged areas to take on functions of areas affected by disease. This really is pretty fantastic, but unfortunately it just can't keep pace with disease activity. Eventually neurological reserve is exhausted and cognitive deficits become apparent. But that's not the end of the story. Neurological reserve has two components. Brain reserve, which refers to the size of the brain, and cognitive reserve, which is the ability to actively compensate and to make more effective and efficient use of brain networks. Our lifetime experiences can increase cognitive reserve and help to maintain brain reserves. This gives us a better chance to hang on to cognitive function if life throws us a curveball in the shape of a disease or injury. All other things being equal, People with multiple sclerosis with high cognitive reserve lose less cognitive function than those with less cognitive reserve for the same amount of brain pathology. So, give your brain a helping hand by maximizing your brain health. It's like giving your neurological reserves a new lease of life. So, Maximizing your lifelong brain health, health is in some ways like preserving neurological reserve. So just to recap on what the film said there, the neurological reserve has two components, 
brain reserve and cognitive reserve. The brain reserve is the volume of your brain itself, the size, the quantity of the tissue, uh, the number of neurons, the number of brain cells that you have. And then the cognitive reserve is the ability to actively compensate, to make more effect and effective and more efficient use of your brain networks. And both of them, it seems, make an independent contribution to this clinical resi resilience to disease pathology. So the lifetime exposures that we're talking about include things like educational and occupational attainment um, and leisure activities, um, and they can increase cognitive reserve and help us to maintain brain reserves. So you can see why, and, and this certainly came out in terms of a dementia research, that you know, if cognitive reserve, you know, if education level contributes um, to cognitive reserve, well then where does that leave people and older people who, who, who left school early? Um, it it kind of seemed very problematic, certainly in the, in, in the dementia sphere. Are they kind of just, um, it, 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 there's nothing we can do about that. They, they left school and they're now 65 and, and are they more at, at increased risk? Um, but we also know that engaging in what we call stimulating activities, mentally stimulating activities, learning new things, challenging your, your, your brain, also actually seem to offer some protection. So I just want to tell you very briefly about this study. It's called the Bronx Healthy Aging Study. And they were interested in this interaction between educational attainment and engagement in mentally stimulating activities. So they followed 488 um, older people um, who were all healthy at the start of the study. Over the course of the study, which was five years, um, 101 of them went on to develop dementia. Uh, I know, that's kind of pretty shocking numbers. They were all over 65 and healthy at the start. Um, the stimulating activities that they're talking about in this study, um, they're not rocket science kind of stuff. It's reading, writing, crossword puzzles, games, having discussions, playing music, those kind of things that I would refer to as hobbies. Um, what they found was, in the people who went on to develop dementia, in the 101 people, they found that engaging in one activity for one day per week, that was what they called the dose if it was a drug study. Engaging in one activity for one day per week delayed the onset of rapid memory loss for two months. Wow. Yeah, it's, it's pretty incredible. It gets me every time. Um, and I, for me, that shows a, you know, a really interesting payoff. Um, and that positive effect, the good news, was independent of its education level. So it didn't matter whether they left school at 14 or whether they continued on to fourth level, engaging in mentally stimulating activities allowed them to hold on to their cognitive functioning for just that little bit longer. And in the context of um, uh, dementia, what we're trying to do is find ways to change the tra trajectory of that disease, so to keep pushing out as long as possible before symptoms um, uh, uh, emerge. And so you can see how that might help that happen. Um, so, cognitive reserve in MS, uh, it is important to remember that MS research in this area is still really in its infancy, but the research suggests that all other things being equal, um, people with MS with high cognitive reserve lose less cognitive function than people with MS with low cognitive reserve. So that's what the research so far is telling us. So, um, what can you do to keep your brain healthy? Um, I'm going to show you another little one of my clips and then I'll go through some How of these in detail. How can I keep my brain healthy? We all brush our teeth every day, but most of us never spare a thought for our brains. How crazy is that? Of course dental health is super important because we need our teeth to eat, to speak and to smile. But we need our brain for absolutely everything. It really is a precious resource. It allows us to think, to feel, to plan, to love, to laugh, and to remember. All of the important stuff. Oh yes, well, and some of the not so important stuff too. The human brain is actually the most complex known structure in the universe, and most of us carry it around in our skull without giving it a second thought. But here's the thing, our brain is constantly changing, and what shapes it is our behaviors, our experiences, and the lifestyle choices that we make. What we do and what we don't do influences how well our brain functions and even how resilient it can be when faced with challenges such as aging, injury or disease. One of the big things we can do to help our brains is to adopt a brain healthy lifestyle. 
That means looking after our heart health, getting enough sleep, going easy on alcohol, not smoking, managing stress and mood while keeping physically, mentally and socially active. Adopting a brain healthy lifestyle is like investing in brain capital because it not only helps to keep our brain healthy now, but also builds cognitive reserves that can be cashed in at some point in the future to cope with or compensate for disease, damage or decline. In fact, scientific research suggests that a brain-healthy lifestyle can delay the onset of symptoms in some diseases that affect cognitive functions like memory and attention. Everyone with a brain needs to consider brain health, just as everyone with teeth needs to consider dental health. So next time you brush those pearly whites, use it as a daily reminder to pay some attention to your amazing brain. So I'm just going to go into a little bit more detail. I like to split, this, split these up into um, activity, attitude and lifestyle. Um, so you, you had, um, we have an exercise expert in the room. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, I just get a. I, I, I mean, really, it's the best thing that you can do for your brain health. It is just the best thing. And I do appreciate that when you're living with something like MS, it can be hard to get motivated to get exercising, but it is the best thing um, that you can do. Your brain weighs only 2% of your body, but it consumes about 20% of the oxygen and nutrients that you take in. Um, so it really needs a good supply of oxygen and nutrients. And physical activity is known to have a direct benefit on both the structure of your brain and the functioning of your brain. Physical in inactivity is associated with increased risk of cardiovascular disease, of heart disease, and your heart health is super important for your brain health. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, and research shows that aerobic fitness in MS is associated with faster information processing and with preserved brain tissue volume. So, Exercise helps to grow um, brain connections. It's associated with better cognitive function. It's also associated with increased activity in areas of your brain associated with attention. Now that's actually very important for memory because attention is the first step in the memory making process. You can't remember, you can't encode something that you haven't paid attention to. Um, so that's really important. And we also think that getting physically exercise um, may improve day to day memory um, because it's associated with reduced levels of depression, stress and anxiety, all of which can impact on your memory function. So, Physical exercise is good for your brain health because it's also good for your mental health. So whatever way you can, find a way to be um, active. And I'm not sure, I think you may have mentioned it in a slightly different context, but um, it's, it's not just about getting those, um, that, that number of, of minutes per week in physical aerobic activity. We need to sit less. We need to stand more. We're, we're, we're you know, so, so to, to find ways for various, um, for various uh, reasons, um, both physical health um, as well. Um, staying socially engaged, um, loneliness and social isolation um, uh, are really bad for your general health um, as well as your mental health and your brain health. People with more social ties actually live longer. They have better health they're less depressed, and they're less likely to develop cognitive impairment. This is in the general population, not specifically within the MS population. In terms of um, impact on health, negative impact on health, loneliness and soci social isolation are comparable with smoking and obesity in terms of the detriment to your health. Um, so loneliness is quite literally a killer. And I think it's particularly relevant um, in terms of multiple sclerosis because there may be that... Um, you know, desire to withdraw um, when, when things get tough, uh, to shut people um, out for various reasons and also because if mobility is affected that you can't get out to engage socially. But it is absolutely vital that you do that 
for, for, your, um, for your brain health. Um, research shows that just 10 minutes social interaction can increase your brain performance and it may actually deliver better benefits than doing things like solving crossword puzzles and um, those kind of things. And being socially engaged, we're social creatures. Being socially engaged is rewarding um, and it, you know, it benefits brain health. Um, the thing about to understand about when we become socially isolated, we're social creatures. We're meant to be part of a social group. Um, when we become socially isolated for whatever reason, um, if it's to do with MS and we've just felt we just want to be away for, from, from people, um, from a survival perspective, our brain actually becomes alert to the fact that we're no longer part of a protective group. So sleep I'm going to talk about a little bit more later. Sleep is super important for brain health. Um, but when we become socially isolated, um, in order to protect us, um, the most vulnerable we're at at any point uh, you, you know, in life as, as, as humans is when we're asleep. And if you're not part of a group, you're particularly vulnerable from a survival perspective. And so your brain doesn't let you go into that deep, deep sleep. It keeps you on this higher level of alertness. Um, and so you then start to experience disrupted sleep and you're not getting the benefits of, of, of sleep that you need. You also actually become less empathetic less trustful of other people and so actually you might start to appear a little socially odd and it's not that people who are socially odd or socially inadequate become socially isolated it's the reverse we become a little bit socially inept because we become socially isolated so it's really really important to stay um, socially connected um, go mental. Learning generates new brain cells. I am completely and utterly passionate about lifelong learning. Um, our school systems have a lot to answer for in turning us off education, but it doesn't have to be academic. It really doesn't matter what it is you're learning. Just learn new things all the time. Give yourself new experiences. Um, have fun. The point is to challenge yourself because with the challenge is where your brain will, will get the, the, the boost. You've got to push yourself beyond your comfort zone. Um, and actually you get more joy out of life when you do that, more sense of achievement from pushing yourself and doing things. It helps to enrich your brain networks and will help to allow your brain open new routes that the brain can use to bypass damage. So it's really important to keep challenging yourself. Um, so basically, yeah, lifelong learning education are good for brain health. They also lower your risk of developing dementia. After age, low levels of education or cognitive stimulation are the biggest risk factors for dementia. So even from that perspective. Um, so yeah, um, anything, reading, hobby, artistic, creative pastimes, um, uh, they all offer protection. Um, challenge yourself to do new things. It's really vital um, for brain health. Lifestyle factors, loving your heart is the most important thing you can do. Um, heart health and brain health are closely linked. I've already said this about your brain using more energy than any other organ. So your brain really depends on an intact and healthy cardiovascular system. If you smoke, you just gotta, sw you just gotta quit. Just gotta quit smoking, it's so bad for your brain. Um, um, it's toxic and it deprives your brain of oxygen. Um, check your health, know your numbers. I know that you're focused on having MS, but you also need to check things like your blood pressure, um, your, your, your cholesterol levels, all those kind of things, anything to do with your heart health. And shop for your brain when you go shopping. Um, people often ask me, what foods do you recommend? It's really the, the biggest evidence in terms of brain health really is around a Mediterranean diet, lots of colorful vegetables, oily fishes, all that healthy stuff, all stuff that you know already, really. Uh, get physical is the best thing you can do for your heart as well. And try to maintain a healthy weight and a healthy diet. Choosing balance is really important and especially when you've got MS. Your brain and your body thrive on regularity. That's, there's a reason why you're, you know, it's suggested that you take your medication at regular intervals, that you eat your food at regular intervals. Your brain is like this master controller that's trying to figure out where you need energy, when, what, what, what you need to do. And if it doesn't know when its next source of energy is coming from, it, you know, it, it becomes less efficient at what it's supposed to do. So regularity is hugely important from all sorts of aspects, food, exercise, sleep. Um, so it really needs that. And, and you need a balance between um, 
uh, stress and calm in your life and um, and you do need stress gets a bad rap I'll talk about it a bit more but um, you do need some stress in your life and um, it's, it's beneficial um, are you engaged in all work and no play do you balance technology with nature that's a hard one um, and also drink plenty of water I know that can be an issue um, as well but it is important your brain needs to be kept hydrated um, you don't want your brain dehydrating and, and brain cells dying off. You need to be drinking water and watch the alcohol consumption. We used to say that, you know, moderate alcohol, alcohol in moderation, but a huge study um, uh, last year published showed that even moderate consumption of alcohol is really detrimental to cognitive functioning. Um, cherish sleep. Um, this, I would be passionate about the, the, the sleep issue. And if you have trouble sleeping, Engaging in physical exercise will help you um, sleep better. But your brain needs restful sleep to run smoothly. Um, it needs your consolidation of memory, it, it, integration with your past experience. All those things happen while you're asleep in, and in particular stages of sleep. Also, we think that some clearing out of toxins happen while we're asleep. So if you're not getting proper sleep, you can have a buildup of, of, of toxins occurring in your brain. So you have to prioritize sleep. It is so important. There has to be a reason that sleep has survived from an evolutionary perspective. It serves a hugely important um, purpose. And we have, a, you know, the World Health Organization have said, you know, we're entering a sleep, um, a sleep deprived um, epidemic. We are just not getting sufficient amounts of sleep when we're not prioritizing sleep. Go to bed and get up at the same time. Your brain doesn't know it's the weekend. <laughs> it just needs that regularity. Um, managing stress, having downtime before you go to bed. Get rid of the technology out of the bedroom. Tele te televisions, telephones, laptops. The blue light that comes out from any of that technology um, fools your brain into, in, into thinking that it should be awake. So try and cut out the technology for at least an hour before you go to bed and make your bedroom a tech-free zone. Get an old school um, alarm clock for beside your bed rather than the phone, because if you pull the phone, I do it, you pull the phone to see what time it is, next thing you're on Twitter and you're you know, scrolling and, and you're awake. Um, avoid ca caffeine or alcohol close to bedtime, eat lightly in the evening, and manage any conditions or medications that impact on your sleep quality. And if you do think that medications are impacting on your sleep quality, you need to talk to your doctor about it and, and, and weigh up the pros and, and, and cons of that. Um, I, what am I back at? Uh, this should be attitude. I knew there was something funny there. That shouldn't say activity. That should say attitude. Um, be present. We talked, uh, you know, I have mentioned mindfulness and people talk a lot about mindfulness. I just like to talk about being present in the moment. Live in the moment. Enjoy life in the moment. Um, it's good for your mental health to do that. Never too far forward, never too far back. Just living in the moment and focusing on what you're doing while you're doing it. It's an, a natural antidote to absent-mindedness, which, you know, is another word for for, for, you know, um, sort of impairment of attention or memory function. Um, you can adopt, um, you know, talking yourself through tasks. That can help if your cognitive functioning um, is a little bit off. It's something that pilots do when they fly, fly planes. They talk themselves through everything that they're doing, and that actually helps them to say, stay present and focused on the tasks that they're doing. I try to do it maybe, you know, once a day, just even on routine things when you're preparing the dinner, you know, just focus on the task instead of always trying to multitask, which is a bit of a myth anyway. Really what we're doing is task switching. Um, so yeah, be, being in the moment helps you stay away from things like anxiety, stress and depression, which also impact on your cognitive function. Um, so managing stress um, is um, poorly, I, I, I mentioned stress earlier that it, it kind of gets a bit of a bad rap because we think, oh, stress is so bad for you. you. You can't function without cortisol. You know, cortisol is, people refer to that as the, 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 the stress hormone. You know, you need cortisol to get out of, the, out of bed in the morning. You get a little spike of cortisol that gets you out of bed. You need cortisol to, to respond to those challenges that I'm saying that you should have in your life. Um, it, it, it's there up and down throughout the day. However, um, if you have poorly managed chronic stress, um, then um, that 
stress sends that whole that that sends your whole stress response system out of whack and in 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 fact actually what happens is the hippocampus is a part of your brain that's involved in memory making and in learning and when you're in an acute stress situation when the stress response kicks off sends cortisol etc ultimately into your into your hippocampus and it actually enhances memory in an acute situation so say you've just been mugged or something like that it enhances your memory so that you remember not to get into that situation, you know, not to go down that dark alleyway again, or you remember how you escaped from the mugger. It enhances your memory. Once that acute stress situation has passed, there's a lovely little feedback system that shuts down the release of those um, uh, chemicals in your body associated with the stress response. Now, in chronic stress, we think that something happens, something goes awry with that um, feedback loop that switches it off. And so cortisol continues to get released in this part of your brain, the hippocampus. And when it's released in the long term, it has the opposite effect. Um, it prevents nor the growth of new neurons. Um, it interferes with neuroplasticity in your brain, which is really important for learning. Um, and it actually really, it impairs learning um, and it impairs memory. So it is hugely important, particularly when you have a disease like MS, which may in itself feel like a chronic stressor. It is important to find ways to manage that stress so that you don't have the added impact that stress can be having on your brain. You don't want to be losing more brain cells because you're stressed. So that's what I try to do, that helps. You know, we all have people who push our buttons and make you stress no matter what you do. But I kind of look at them now and I kind of go, are they really worth me getting holes in my brain for? No, they're not. So just try and, and, and think of that. And, and, and then um, it also impairs concentration and that chronic stress can pave the way for depression. It impacts on your immune function and um, it can lead ultimately to anxiety and it also increases your risk of developing dementia in later life. So to manage stress I have a list of things. Be excited. So you can rename stress as excitement sometimes because if you think about the feelings in your gut they're kind of very similar. Um, be active, being physically active, being present, being positive. Um, being balanced in life, being re realistic about what you can achieve and what those around you can achieve, be practical about the things that you could do, be interested in life and the things that you're doing, try to be happy, fake it till you make it, um, and be connected with people. I'm on to my final tip, um, which is my favourite one, which is to keep smiling. There was loads, I was outside in the hallway there and there was loads of laughter and smiling and people joking and having fun and that's hugely important um, it's a great brain health booster it's free it helps to boost growth of those brain cells in that part of your brain involved in memory called the hippocampus um, um, it makes your brain more resilient. It releases hormones that make you feel good. It actually lowers your blood pressure. It boosts your immune function. So it helps to protect against stress, anxiety, and de depression. And the, here's the thing. The simple act of smiling, just turning the corners of your lips up with the muscles, actually gives you all of those health benefits. So even if you don't feel like smiling, if you force yourself to do it, actually particularly if you don't feel like smiling, go for the smile because it actually will give you those um, benefits. So I prescribe smiling five times a day. Once first thing in the morning, so you start the day right. Once last thing at night, so that you end the day right. I suggest that you share at least one smile with somebody else because smiling is contagious. It's very, there's a lady smiling there and it's very hard for me not to smile back at her because that's the human condition. So you're spreading the health benefits and you can do whatever you want with the other two smiles. I think I'm probably just running over time. So uh, I had another clip which, oh no I am, I'm grand, I'm done. Um, that's my last slide actually. Um, so that's, um, yeah, all those tips for brain health. I want to say thank you to Novartis who actually gave an educational grant for me to develop all of these um, materials and that's the name of the website. Thank you very much. Everybody just wants to go home. Oh yes, we have one. Last question. This is really the one that was down in the limbic system, no? The amygdala and the brain. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
and the, the amygdala is in, involved with, yeah, with fear, yes. And uh, so uh, the question is in the, in the sense of this, uh, I actually have a comedy show where I, uh, where I talk about the limbic system okay. and, and, uh, and the effects about on, on emotional intelligence and yes. stuff like that. And uh, um, my question is, like, do lesions actually exist within, within the limbic system? Or why, why is, uh, what's actually physically happening within the brain that, that is mucking around with our emotions, let's say? So when you say it just it, the, the, limb, the, the limbic system doesn't operate in isolation. Right. So when we talk about the amygdala being involved in, in say, the fear response, if we take right. that, that's the immediate acute response. But it also has connections with your frontal lobes, which are more your higher functioning. So uh, say if you have a startle response, you, you, you hear a, a noise and you, know, you want to jump back or, or you know, that instinct to run. That's, that's the basic function in, in, in your older part of the brain, the limbic part of the brain. But actually, a little bit later, this part of your brain, the frontal lobes, which evolved later uh, in, in human in involvement, actually makes a broader appraisement of the situation and decides whether you've just been pranked or you know, whether it really is something and, and sends messages back. So they actually speak to each other. But sometimes with things like stress, chronic stress, if you're chronically stressed, that communication system gets screwed up. Similarly, if you're not getting proper sleep, um, connections or you're, you're not learning, you're not learning from experience and, and they get screwed up. With actually, with regard to um, asking, answering questions about where lesions appear, I'm not a medical doctor, I'm not a neurologist, so I actually can't answer that unless there's, there's somebody here who can, and it would be wrong of me to attempt that. I can just give you from a, you know, a, a neuroscience and a psychologist perspective. But they don't operate. Actually, to be honest, very little part of your, of, of your brain operates in, in isolation. Yes, for me it's this thing of, uh, like, they, they talk about the most rudimentary uh, basis of, the, of this is kind of like the fight or flight res responses and things like that. But uh, um, frustration is uh, one of, uh, that would be one of my kind of uh, big kind of uh, feelings in this emotional intelligence area. And uh, it, it is a, sor a, sor a source of stress in a, in a way, but you don't, even, you don't even know it sometimes, you know? And so when you say that frustration, do you mean frustrated with yourself for not being able to do things that you want to do? Is that what you would no, mean? No, more, more becoming uh, short-tempered. At least other people tell me, you know? Yeah. <laughs> And uh, you know, it's all this is all about, about perceptions. But yeah. uh, uh, no, but I can feel sometimes that I get you get you get short. Uh, in my show, I talk about how I, I've got ridiculous emo new emotional things. I can't watch uh, I could, uh, certain things like uh, going out, going to watch. I can't watch uh, emotive sport, let's say, in a, in a in a bar anymore because. I'm a, I'm a blubbering mess if it's too if it's uh, if it's too emotional too much emotional. I can't emotional even watch shows like the X Factor. <laughs> there you, go. you know, <laughs> I just I can't do the crying thing. It's it, it, it's too, it's too much. Um, it, ju it just feels very exaggerated. And I'm wondering, is there techniques to to quell those those, those kinds of emotional intelligence kind of triggers? Uh, I, that uh, I, I I think you touched on it there actually when you said it's all about perception. Yeah. So, you know, in, there, there's no denying whether it's the disease, whether it's a lack of sleep, whether it's because you're chronically stressed, whether it's because you're ill, though all of those things actually make us more tetchy. You know if you had, haven't had a night's sleep, you're, you're more short-tempered. So your brain is trying to operate on less resources than it, than it did in the past. Um, however, when it comes to, say, something like stress, um, uh, there's the physiological res response to stress, so the release of those hormones I'm talking about, but there's also psychological stress, and that's about our perception of what I call the stressor, the objective thing. Um, and, and that's very individual, and that is about perception. And what stresses me 
might excite you. Do you know, you might love roller coasters and I can't even go on rollerblades. Do you know what I mean? It, 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 it's too much. So, so it's very individual, but, but the, the, the point being that it actually doesn't matter whether the objective stressor is a real stressor or not. If you perceive it to be a real stressor, it kicks off the stress response in your body. So the control lies, in a sense, in that perception, in that managing how you perceive the stressor and working on that. Like any behavior, we can have control over how we think about things. So that can help because there's not a lot we can do about some objectors in, in objective stressors in life. There's not a lot you can do about getting MS. There's not a lot you can do if someone you love dies or if, if you lose your job. But you do have some control over how you respond to that. And that, in turn, will influence how your brain responds in that physiological way that can be so detrimental to your physical health, your mental health, and your brain health. Does that help That's answer? Yeah. Yeah. It's, something, it's, it's something that just came on with me when I, when I kind of became, uh, I've got PPMS. Don't hear much about it today, never do. And, uh, uh, but it's something that kind of, it's, it came, it's a very, it's a symptom, I'd say the biggest symptom that came with my MS, right. PPMS. And uh, I work kind of very publicly. I'm very, uh, it's a very social thing that I do. And, and basically I run comedy festivals and stuff like that and, and, and productions and all that kind of stuff. But uh, so uh, it's, it's a kind of impairment that, that's quite unwelcome. And, uh, and it, but, it, but it's quite profound when it, it, it arrived, you know, so. Uh, I, I think that's a very, very impo important point that you make, um, that people, I was discussing this actually in relation to something else, that it, it, it is a symptom and consequence of, of your disease for whether we don't understand, you know, exactly how, how it works. Um, and the thing is, people are very forgiving of, you know, physical and accommodating of physical symptoms. They're less so when they're those kind of what we might call negative emotions. I mean, I, I, I don't like that negative or positive emotions. We have emotions. Anger serves a purpose. You know, so, so, so does, you know, irritability or whatever. It may be a signal to you that you need more rest and more sleep, whatever. But I think we need to have more open conversations about those kind of symptoms. And and ask people to be a little bit more considerate. Instead of being critical of you and saying, you're very bloody irritable or you're very bloody short-tempered, as if somehow, you know, it's got nothing to do with your disease, that actually in calmly we say, well, look, I actually can't, I can't do a lot about that or I'm working on it, but it is a symptom, just like, you know, other more obvious symptoms. <laughs> There's a very good TED talk on uh, managing stress by a lady called Kenny McGonigal. I don't know if you've seen it. She's a, a professor in Stanford. Uh -huh. um, and it's, it's fundamentally um, about um, stress being, you can view it, as you said, positively or negatively. Um, you know, the, 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 my outlook on stress is that stress is telling me that there's something I should be doing. And if I'm not doing it, well, then I should be stressed. You know, and therefore, to relieve the stress, I should just get on with doing it. Right. Um, you know, so stress is a positive thing. Um, you know, it's a spur to action. Um, and then when you, when you actually do it, um, you know, you've done something. And uncertainty is different um, in that, you know, uncertainty is something you can't control. But perhaps there is something that you can do that mitigates the worst effect of it. Then, then there's something you can do. So there's no point in getting stressed about that. Just do what you can. And control um, is a very big issue when yeah. stress flips into anxiety. Absolutely. Because people think anxiety is about uh, worry. But actually, for a lot of people, anxiety is about feeling out of control or not being able to control things in their lives. And, and, and you really have to accept that you can't control. And the, and the other, just an, another um, thing on that is, I don't know if anybody read Viktor Frankl, Man's Search for Meaning. Um, one of the things he says in that book, which is really, it was a light bulb moment for me, is that um, you don't get to choose what happens to you in life, but you do get to choose how you think about it and react to it. And if you take on that part of the control, um, you know, th that's, that's a phenomenally positive and, um, um, a, a way of thinking um, ab about thinking your way through your MS and thinking about how to be positive and optimistic. Um, I have to say, fantastic talk. Thank you. Okay. Really, really good.